Welcome in, everyone. We have a fascinating topic today, Delta Force versus the 2-2 SAS. What are the similarities? What are the difference? The history of the organizations and much more. Before we get into that, as always, I need you guys to like, subscribe, and comment with your thoughts on the video. The more you like, subscribe, and comment, the greater reach the video has, the more people get to see it, and the more stories of heroes, American heroes, and heroes of our allies we get to share. So make sure you're liking, subscribing, and commenting with your thoughts. Right off the bat, what is the 2-2 SAS? They are the original OG counterterrorism direct action unit in the history of modern warfare, if you will. They are British. They're part of the UK. Well, I guess I shouldn't say they're British. They're part of the United Kingdom's military. They're their tier one asset. They are what Delta Force and essentially all other major premier counterterrorism units, whether it's the Australian SAS, the New Zealand SAS, Delta Force is modeled after. They became famous during the Iranian hostage siege at the Iranian embassy when they rushed in to conduct a rescue operation took out the bad guys, and that was really the first time the world had ever publicly known a bunch about the SAS, but they've been all over the place. They've done a ton of different missions. They have a really, really cool job. They can also act domestically as to where in the U.S., Delta Force, if you didn't know, can do it as well. When that balloon goes up, as they say, it's just a little more hoops need to be jumped through. So they have a domestic mission. They have a direct action mission, a counterterrorism mission, and they've been all over the globe, shoulder to shoulder with Delta Force, fighting the enemy, whether that's ISIS, whether it's Iraq, whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's in Africa. The SAS stands shoulder to shoulder with Delta Force. And the question is, which one's better? Is Delta Force the better counterterrorism unit? Is the SAS a better counterterrorism unit? Which one is better at hostage rescue? Is it Delta Force? Is it the SAS? And the truth of the matter is it's a very nuanced, complicated thing. And before I give my breakdown, we're going to wa launch, watch, excuse me, we're going to watch a series of clips here featuring Delta Force, featuring the SAS, and then featuring someone who is a a, an outsider, a 24th STS member, giving his opinion on the SAS. So you guys can kind of get a broad feel of the entire thing. We're first going to start with Lindsey Bruce, who's a former SAS operator who worked closely with Delta Force. And he's going to share in these clips a couple stories. Number one, he's going to share a story about a Delta guy who went over to the 2-2 SAS to train and work with him as part of his counterterrorism squadron. And they got into a little shooting competition. And it did not go well for the SAS. Delta Force cleaned up that one. And then in the next clip with, with uh, Lindsey, he's going to talk about his experience working with Delta in an actual combat zone. Let's roll those clips now. But then I remember you say that the, the SAS are known for ha the, the sharpshooters and all that. I'll tell you something. I remember when we were on the special projects team, which is like the, you know, the counter terrorist with the, the UK responsibility. Um, and we had a, had a guy in the exchange uh, from Delta. So this, this Delta guy, a guy called Ken came over and he was an awesome guy. He was quite a quiet, introverted guy, but really, really fucking good. And he came over and he joined our squadron. And we had a we did the he did the sniper course with us so we we did we were doing the counter terrorist sniper sniper course before the special projects team uh, became our remit, and we went down to the range, and you know you're all you're obviously going to be competitive if there's an American there we all want to be better right and he fucking kicked our asses like he was better than all of us, <laughs> and everyone was going oh, this is embarrassing because he was really really good, he was like a fucking amazing sharpshooter this guy. Is is I mean I've never seen him like it. He was he was next level good, and I mean he, he he was flying the flag for for you guys, for your side of the pond really high, and I always remember we were we were like sat there being a bit you know acting a little bit humble because I thought shit the, this the the Yank is is better at shooting than all of us even our best shots he just he just wiped the floor, he's well, brilliant. In your team interview team house interview I heard you say that I think Delta was kind of they were living right next to you guys at one point in yeah. Iraq. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So what is the number one? Did you do any like cross hits with them? Did you guys work together a lot or were you kind of on your own and they were on their own? No, we worked, we worked co-located with them for a reason as well. You would we'd, we'd be working together as well. So it, again, it depends on the size of the target. And sometimes they sometimes like there were, there were multiple target nights as well. So, so you could go through a night and hit three targets um, if it was one big target, then obviously th there was only a squadron of us over there at any one time. So 
you might need everyone. So we would work together as a coalition. So as a joint special forces group, Delta would have, you know, all you're doing is, is making the team bigger because everyone's a professional special forces soldier. So we would, you know, we would essentially have the Delta and, and, and T2 SAS, you know, working together for a bigger target. But you would then have like the US Rangers doing like the, the cordons and the outer cordon work to then, you know, make sure that we could be, uh, you know, doing the job that we were responsible for. So again, it depends on the size of the target. They had their targets, we had our targets, but if there was a larger target that required a bigger team, then that's when you collaborate. I, I know that every Delta guy I've ever interviewed has nothing but amazing things to say about the SAS. I know they hold yeah. SAS operators in insanely high regard. As a yeah. as a as an SAS veteran, what would you say the outlook is reversed? How do SAS guys view dudes who are in Delta Force, which is America's tier one tip of the mm. spear direct action unit? Oh, br- brilliant! Really, I mean, every every bit is good. Really, you know, it, just they just get better equipment, <laughs> get better kit than us. <laughs> but um, there's some amazing amazing soldiers in Delta, obviously, and and we're both very mutually respectful. There is no com- com- competitiveness in that sense, saying one's better than the other, because we work together. You know, they come over and, and exchange with us and we send guys over there for, you know, six months, 12 months. So there's a lot of mutual respect with us and Delta. It's, it's like the, the US equivalent, really. Yeah, it is. And and like I yeah. said, they love the SAS. They say great things about mm. the SBS. They, I mean, it does seem like everyone at that tier one level like there is so much mutual respect because you guys have been through Absolutely. so the training, yeah. the combat. Um, so that's Lindsey Bruce's opinion of Delta Force, his experiences with him. Obviously, you can tell he has so much respect for the unit, just like unit guys have so much respect for the 2-2 SAS. We also now have former SAS operator Melvin Downs giving his opinion on American operators at the unit. So again, you're not taking my word for it. I'm not making this up. This is coming from an actual SAS operator who is widely respected. Melvin Downs is viewed as an all-time great guy. Let's see what he had to say right now. Down. That's actually a great segue because I want to talk to you about the relationship that Delta and the SAS have because Delta is modeled off of, off of the SAS. Charles Beckworth went over there, I believe, in the late 70s learned from them, came back and, and modeled what now the unit Delta Force CAG. When what how do when the SAS thinks about Delta Force, when they when they view them as warriors, soldiers, what type of view does the average SAS guy have of the average guy in the unit? Oh, they they're very professional. They, they like ourselves, they they really go I, but what I find is we seem to be more of a jack of all trades. You see what I mean, Master No, because as I said, we 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 have to concentrate on every area of operations, but also internal as well, internal uh, counterterrorism as well. Uh, yeah, but the, they, no, they're really good guys, and they used to come across to us regularly as well. So we did we do a lot of exchange the the SES and the the S, uh, I mean Delta. We did all the time together. So sometimes they come across. And do all our ranges. What I found is you always had you always had the better kit. It's like Big Brother always had the better kit. You know what I mean? But the soldiers, the soldier, they're always the same. You know what I mean? Was the tell, kit? You just tell the special forces soldier, except I think it's just American way. You uh, they still to all that tobacco and all that sort of stuff, and <laughs> that, that still goes on. And uh, they like the big. We like a big mug, but they have a big jug of protein shakes and they, they still they still like to puff up a bit more whereas we don't you know what I mean we just keep it normal training but... is the kit being different is that just what comes down to money for research and development that the US just has more money that they're willing to spend on night vision or whatever it might be or how does you know we're very close allies why, why do you think our kit would be better than what you guys would get well, our special forces, we get by far the best kit than what any of the military do. But then I think we always sort of take from what your weapons or what, what you've done next, we sort of get your kit, if you if you know what I mean. For instance, when you join the special forces, we 
straight away we always had American we, we had American like weapons well it was a project between American and Canadian DeMarco like a sort of the M4 or the, the Donut but it's based off everything sort of the based off the American weapons we never we didn't use the SA-80 what the normal army used the normal British weapon because they were dog shit they were just breaking down it's took, it's two years to get them prepared the amount of people that I, I reckon must have lost their lives through them just having they were 40 they were that first Gulf War in the desert, as soon as you got a bit of sand in there, and they, 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 they jam up, they were useless. So, so we never, once they got to the special forces, they were like, oh, we, we aren't having them. We have proper kit, you know, good kit. Which to me, that's just terrible if you think about it. I remember, we used to just have a body armor in the normal army, and it should just be just, it was about, I don't know, about six inches by eight inches, and it just protect your art and your vital organs and that was it and it was inside a, a sort of a fat vest it's just that was just there to keep you together you know what i mean so unless that that bullet is anywhere else that we didn't even used to have full body armor that's they've got full body armor now but it took a long long time but the special forces already had always had full body armor so we always had the better kit there but it's not just the kit it's the resources and facilities so we come we, we come across to you because when we training say on aircraft trying to blow doors, we'd have a big aircraft and we'd have wooden doors and blow them up. You go over to America and this is it Air Force Pope, they've got a massive elephant's graveyard full of aircraft. So you practice on all different aircraft and you blow real doors and these doors cost a lot of money because it's obviously it's specific doors need specific charges. So to practice and blowing real doors and sometimes you'd be blowing, we'd be blowing several doors a day and each door costs i don't know how many thousand and 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 taking on like a specific vehicles say if you was in vip the vip role looking after uh delegates and dignitaries and something happened you know how to break in break in an armored vehicle or take on an armored vehicle we'd be taking on some of these armored vehicles there's not wrong with them they'd only been they've been in your state department or whatever just for a couple of years and then we were using them to blow up and and get inside, uh, to tactically get inside and get inside a secure vehicle, and also your all your ranges. I used to go with the uh, with SEAL Team Six. That was brilliant. We'd be up in Nevada, and they'd make a range full of full balsa wood, and we'd, we'd blow it to bits, all different targets. Come back next day, and they built another range with all different specific buildings and houses. In the UK, there's only a certain couple of places where you can drop live ordnance, so. It'd be the same boring drops, whereas there, we even had tanks and where they drop drop chalk bombs on, so you could get them drop chalk bombs, and they, we'd have the a couple of howitzers firing Willie Pete, firing white phosphorus, so we could use them as guided. And it's just amazing the your facilities compared to what we've got, and obviously it's money. So we'd go over across to yours to uh, scrounge off you a little bit and do the courses and that, and then you come across to ours and. And we take you on some of our training. So right. yeah, yeah, you've definitely got it's the resources, you know. We, the what what was it? The uh, C seventeens in it, the big aircraft. Yeah, I remember just getting. I don't know. We've got a couple of them now, but we didn't used to have them. I remember getting them one of them. You know, that would take a battalion of us. You think seventy of them? That's it. I mean, seventy of them would take our entire army. <laughs> you've got Did everything. You when you were in Iraq, did you, were you ever on operations at the same time as Delta was, like yeah, together? Yeah. yeah, yeah, not specifically in the same teams, but we were right. going to joint operations. Yeah, when we trade information, got a lot of respect for Delta and a lot of respect for the SEAL team. SEAL team six. So there you go. You heard Melvin's opinion of Delta Force as someone who served in the two two SAS. Now let's hear from a Delta Force operator. Bob Porras about his views of the SAS. Um, I recently interviewed a former member of the SAS, uh, Lindsey Bruce, in, in first ever SAS guy I interviewed. And people were like, you got to get a Delta operator's opinion on the SAS because he, the SAS guy, had a ton of things to say about the unit because they'd cross trained. He deployed mm -hmm. to Iraq with them. What is your opinion as a former Delta Force member of the SAS in England. Yep, they're good. Yeah, they're good. Um, and they have they have a, a 
they they used to be more oriented towards their domestic responsibilities because they can actually operate in in uh, England as well. So they're actually uh, so back to the um, uh, Princess Gate thing back in the day, right? Uh, they can do that. We can't because we're uh, army and uh, Pascomitanus and all that stuff. We can't operate within the United States, but um since the GY and that all the time they spent in the war zones um they're a little bit more uh, combat oriented and um i think that their counterparts over in australia the same way so there you heard from bob porus his views of what he thinks about the SAS and up next we're actually going to now go to a 24th STS member mike lamonica great guy the 24th STS is the air force's tier 1 element and he's going to explain his view of working with the SAS as a Tier 1 operator, but on the Air Force side, not Delta. He has some great things to say about the SAS. You can watch that right here. Is there a specific NATO ally of yours that you've always been really impressed by? Maybe I know everyone talks about like England and France, but is there a NATO ally that has always kind of, for you, been impressive? Um, one stands out because of a decision, but before I get to that, um... I've worked with SOF in many countries, Australian, British, or the Polish Grom, the Brits, Italians, uh, Spanish. Um, I've had the good fortune of being around a lot of them, and they they all produce really good people. They're funded and equipped different, differently than we are in the U.S., but they're all really good. They're good at what they do. Um, the best decision I saw throughout my entire career was when I was with the Brits in Iraq. Uh, we came, as a matter of fact, the night we came off that target I was talking about, um, it was in the morning, so sun's coming up, we land at the, the base, the forward operating base, and Intel meets at the, at the um, vehicles and says, hey, we got to beat on Zarqawi, we want you to go get Zarqawi right now. And uh, had I been with some of the other forces I've worked with, they'd have turned around, gotten on a helicopter and gone after them without even thinking about it. And the Brits went, we want to do some mission analysis. And we went back to the uh, op center. We went to a room. The officers actually said, hey, enlisted guys, go do your thing. And I watched the enlisted SAS guys go through the decision-making process. They laid out all the facts and assumptions and to include the condition of us. Like we had just go, we've been doing back-to-back -back missions every night, not getting a whole lot of sleep, and we're coming off a target. They want us to go faster up into a hardened target after the sun came up. And the, the guys went, first off, we don't believe your intel is completely accurate. If it is, he won't move because he doesn't move during the day, so he'll be there. We'll go get four or five hours of sleep. We'll wake up, and then we'll, we'll go into mission planning, but we're not going right now. Uh, and the officers backed him up on it. And I remember just sitting there in awe going, this was the best decision I've ever seen made. Not only was the decision good, but how they got to it was really good. Um, so I have a strong affinity for the British SAS because I spent 10 days with them and I've watched them make a decision that I know for a fact other forces would have gone, we'd have gotten a helicopter shot out of the sky for no reason because we'd have gone in the daytime. He wouldn't have been there. It's still a hard target. And, um, you know, when you faster by the helicopter in the morning, when people are just waking up, you're nothing but a target. Um, I thought it was a great decision. So I have a strong affinity for the British SAS. Did they ever get a concrete answer whether or not he had been there when they thought well, he was? Yeah. Yeah. By the time we woke up, they're like, yeah, he's not there. And the enlisted guys were like, exactly. You know, so you either send us into something, but uh, dude, the Intel guys, they were like, you got to go do it now or we'll lose this opportunity. And uh, they just didn't allow the emotion of the moment to get in the way of making a good decision. Uh, it, was, it was impressive. As you can see, there is great respect. There is so much respect between Delta and the 2-2 SAS. There is so much respect going the other way from the SAS to Delta. But it, when it comes down to it, who's better? Who is more capable? One thing that I've often heard from SAS operators that sets Delta apart, and they might argue that Delta is actually better than they are, again, their words, not mine, is the level of funding and money. Delta Force has a much bigger budget than the SAS. They have much better gear. They can buy whatever they want. They can essentially train wherever they want. They have an unlimited amount of resources. That's just because the United States has a much better economy. So in that sense, 
they're, they're going to have better night vision. They're going to have better kit. They're going to have better body armor. They're going to have better everything. That's just the fact of the matter. Not only are they going to have better everything, they're going to have ability to get it quicker than guys at the 2-2 SASs. I've heard stories from dudes in Iraq that the 2-2 SAS, when they invaded, didn't even have night vision initially. Didn't even have it for the first couple of years. They would white light on raids. Meanwhile, Delta had early day four panels as early as 03, 04. Obviously, now you have the panels, which you've all seen in the movies, which are incredibly badass. So in that sense, they have more money. That's a huge, huge, huge advantage for Delta Force. The SAS has the history. They've been around longer. Delta is modeled over them. How much of a difference does that make? Probably in the 80s, probably made a big difference when Delta Force was just getting started, maybe even through the early 90s. By the time Black Hawk Down happened, you then had all the stuff that kicked off in Europe in the 1990s. And then obviously the GWAT, which the SAS was heavily involved in, they were, you know, they were right there again with us shoulder to shoulder. Once all that kicked off, I think the gap was essentially erased. Again, if you listen to, to Delta guys tell the story, if you listen to... SAS guys tell the story. And the other thing to keep in mind here is Delta has a very specific mission set. They are trained to be the best combat shooters on the planet. They are trained to be the best hostage rescue team on the planet, the best hit team on the planet. The SAS is required to do a lot of things. Again, they're required to not just do all of that. They're also required to handle things internally in the UK. You've heard about the troubles. You've heard about what's happened in, in Northern Ireland and Ireland. And they were there doing that. It's almost like if you would see Delta conducting operations within the United States, which can very rarely does happen, but not something we're going to discuss here today. Or, you know, if they're operating on the border, again, not something we're going to discuss here today. When you have a broader mission set, it requires you to divvy up your time a little bit differently than if you had a very narrow, narrow mission set. And for that reason, Delta, I think by anyone who's telling the truth and being honest, has come into that number one spot as the best counterterrorism unit, the best direct action unit, the best hostage rescue unit, and then right below them would be the 2-2 SAS. Number one, Delta. Number two, the 2-2 SAS. After that, you probably have SEAL Team 6. You'd have the Australian SAS, uh, the Polish Grom, the New Zealand SAS, all great units. But Delta at this point, due to the money, due to the training, and due to the fact that the United States has more men to choose from, you can't discount that either. The, the United States has way more men to cycle through, way more options as to where the United Kingdom just has a smaller population. That's just the fact of the matter. You combine all of that, add all of that up, and what do you get? You get Delta Force being the premier counterterrorism. But I want to stress this. Charles Beckwith modeled Delta off the SAS, okay? He modeled the, the unit CAG, whatever we're calling them these days, off the SAS. The respect between the two units is unbelievably high. Delta guys love SAS guys. SAS guys love Delta dudes. They have fought together in every major conflict since the two units came into creation or when Delta came into creation and then they could join the SAS doing, you know, the high-level black ops stuff. They, there is no rivalry between these two like you might see between Delta and SEAL Team 6. You will never hear a Delta guy trash the SAS. You will never hear an SAS guy trash Delta. You will hear them criticize other units. You will not hear them criticize each other. It's just they've shed too much blood. They've done too much killing. And they really are the one-two punch the bad guys never want to see coming. So I am going to make the argument that Delta is the more elite unit in direct action hostage rescue. Having said that, if the SAS shows up and you're in trouble and they're the guys that come in like Christian Craighead uh, in Nairobi, uh, I forget what his nickname is, you're going to be you're going to be in very, very, very capable, well-trained, great hands. So you let me know if you made it this far in the video. You let me know in the comments if you think Delta Force or the SAS is better. Make sure to like, subscribe, and get in those comments with your thoughts, and I'll see you all next time.